this this meeting is recorded so good all right so let me just share my screen perfect yeah okay great uh wow thanks eric for the introduction um it was all correct <laughs> so as we said um I am now the head of the historical and prehistorical genetics lab at Tel Aviv University. But before that, I was a PhD student and then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Evolution, Anthropology in Leipzig. And that's where I did the research that I'll be showing you today. And what I wanna show you today is what started out as a pilot study to try and get ancient human DNA uh, directly from Pleistocene sediments. And sort of this being <laughs> the sedimentary DNA society, I can sort of skip the introduction where I usually explain why sediments are really interesting and really cool. Um, and I'll just say um, simply that if we want to look at the genomes of ancient humans or ancient hominins, why work on sediments? Well, as you know, uh, finding skeletal remains of archaic hominins in Pleistocene context is quite rare, whereas sediments are found abundantly and ubiquitously, ubiquitously in each and every archeological site. And so back in the days of my thesis, we, based on the knowledge that uh, had already been accumulated in the literature that DNA can survive in sediments over long periods of time, we wanted to see whether we could find a way to retrieve, identify, and authenticate hominin DNA from these archeological sediments even when skeletal remains are not there. So to do that, we put together a collection of 85 sediment samples that we collected from seven archeological sites. These were all sites that had uh, known past hominin occupations based on the archeological record. And these uh, came from layers that were dated to between 14,000 and over 600,000 years ago. In the field, samples were collected in one case, uh, wearing full protective gear, as you can see here on the left. In most cases, these were collected using what we could consider as minimal, um, sort of reasonable uh, protective uh, gear. So face masks and gloves to minimize the introduction of contemporary DNA into our samples. And in one case, these were taken from existing collections that were taken um, without any particular precautions in mind. So in the lab, we took these samples, we created subsamples from them, extracted the DNA, and converted the DNA into double index single-stranded libraries. And then one thing that we did was to look at shotgun data from these samples. And what we saw, and this is a figure showing uh, all data from all these libraries put together, is that the vast majority of sequences that we generated, nearly 90%, was not, not identifiable. And out of those that were identifiable, only a small fraction, shown here in green, came from mammals, showing the limitation of using a shotgun approach if what you're interested in is a specific taxon or a specific group of taxa. So instead, we went back into the libraries, and this time, we enriched them for uh, mammalian mitochondrial DNA. And we did that by hybridization capture using a set of probes that targets the full mitochondrial genome sequence of 242 different mammalian species. After sequencing, um, we compared these sequences to a database of uh, 800 um, different non-redundant um, mitochondrial genomes of mammals, and then parsed that data uh, using a lowest common ancestor algorithm in order to identify um, the origin of each of our fragments. We did that at a family level, and then for each family that we identified in each of our libraries, we uh, wanted to verify whether the DNA is indeed of ancient origin. And we did that by looking for the substitutions that are typical of ancient DNA, the cytosine to timing, um, substitutions that derive from deamination of cytosine over time at the extremities of fragments. 
So by doing that, we were able to identify ancient DNA in six out of the seven sites that uh, were in this pilot study. So this worked at all sites except Condulagu, which is a site in the warm area of southern France that is also um, hundreds of thousands of years older than the other sites in our set. So perhaps where preserva or negative preservation of DNA was not a big surprise. Then if we look at what taxa did we identify, we were able to identify ancient mitochondrial DNA from 12 different uh, biological families. And these, um, and here I'm showing you a snapshot of the different families that we identified um, in each site. And these include uh, species that are now extinct. So we have cave bears and cave hyenas, woolly mammoth, woolly rhinos, and so on. Now, as a reminder, what we, we're really interested in is DNA from ancient hominins. And at this point, we had only identified ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA in one site, El Cidron in Spain, where we also had not identified DNA from any other mammal. So one thing needs to be taken into account is that El Cidron is quite unusual in the archeological record in that it is made out of only one archeological stratum where remains of uh, several Neanderthal individuals have been found in hundreds of, of specimens, not individual specimens, but only about a handful, about 12 bones that have been identified from other mammals. And that led us to think that perhaps the reason why we're seeing ancient hominin DNA in El Cidron but not anywhere else, is that at all these other sites, the sheer abundance of DNA from other mammals was overshadowing whatever small traces of hominin DNA may be there. So with that in mind, we went back into the lab, and this time we enriched our libraries specifically for human mitochondrial DNA and then identified um, or authenticated the DNA using a similar strategy. For samples that tested positive for the presence of ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA, we then used diagnostic positions that differentiate between mitochondrial genomes of different groups of hominins. So for example, Neanderthals versus Denisovans versus ancient modern humans using a set of diagnostic positions in the mitochondrial genome. And when it's necessary, we went back to the samples, the extracts and the libraries to generate more data uh, to work with. And then using that strategy, <clears throat> sorry, we were able to identify ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA, not only in El Cidron, but also in three additional sites. We were able then to uh, reconstruct between partial and full mitochondrial DNA genomes from nine sediment samples taken from these four sites and compare them to mitochondrial genome sequences that had been previously uh, reconstructed uh, using skeletal remains. And what we saw was that for eight of these samples shown here in red, the mitochondrial DNA in the sediment fell within the variation of neonatal mitochondrial DNA. Whereas for the last sample taken from the niece of a cave in Siberia, the mitochondrial DNA in the sediment clustered with the niece of mitochondrial DNA. And this showed us that using uh, a handful of sediment samples from these different sites, we were able to retrace quite well the known mitochondrial DNA diversity of hominins in the Pleistocene. So our finding of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in the sediment of El Cidron coincides well with the archeological record. This is, as I said, a layer that is rich with Neanderthal remains. And a similar case is also for Chakilskaya cave in Siberia, where we find Neanderthal DNA in the sediment in a layer where there are several Neanderthal remains that have been found. Now at the niece of a cave, the uh, situation is slightly different. So here I'm showing, showing you a sketch of the stratigraphy of the East Chamber. Um, this is being the top, so more recent, and we go further back in time as we go deeper with the numbers of the layers, which are not very important, but these are the uh, numbers that are marked in gray. And so we found Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in the sediment 
in the same layer where previously a Neanderthal um, bone had been found, um, which yielded the high coverage Neanderthal genome, the Altai genome. But we also found Neanderthal, as well as the Nisevan mitochondrial DNA, deeper in the stratigraphy, indicating that both these groups were present in the Altai region for longer uh, than we thought, just based on the fossil record. And lastly, at Trois-Alves in Belgium, we find Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in a layer where previously no skeletal remains have been found at all, but where the presence of Neanderthal had been inferred based on the archaeological record. So what we learned from that is that using this strategy, it is possible to retrieve ancient mammalian mitochondrial DNA from archaeological sediments. At the time, we were able to go back in time to 240,000 years in Siberia and about 60,000 years in Western Europe. We're now uh, much more um, further back in time, as Ben will show you. We're able to identify a variety of taxa, including extinct taxa. And more importantly, for our purposes, we were able to retrieve, identify, and authenticate DNA from ancient hominins. And given that much of the lab work that is um, uh, necessary to produce this data has now been automatized, um, I think this shows that this is a highly parallelizable and non-destructive way to study the past presence of hominins at archaeological sites, even when skeletal remains are not there. And with that, I'd like to thank um, Eric and the other members of the society for the invitation, um, everybody who was involved in the project that I showed you today, and I take the last 10 seconds just to uh, advertise that um, I'm hiring at my lab. So please check out our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Of course, that was uh, very, uh, very cool. Um, as I said, when we start, we will go directly to the second talk because I guess many questions for Vivian would be also for Benjamin. So uh, we will continue uh, and uh, we can ask questions after uh, Benjamin uh, Verno talk. So you can start sharing your screen if you wish. Perfect, it's in full screen. I should okay. unmute myself probably. Okay, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, okay, so thank you. And much like Vivian, I have the pleasure of removing quite a bit of introductory material, particularly because a lot of it would be repeated from even just Vivian's entire talk, right? So, um, so that's really nice. <clears throat> so yeah, we're going to talk about learning about human history from DNA in sediments. And um, again, our goal, just like for Vivian's, is to learn about human history without using bones. Um, and the two big things that, that are different here are, first, we take the methods a little bit further. So we look at both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA, and there are new methods for both of those. And second, we do it in a really sort of systematic way, right? We sort of try to systematically learn about the history of one particular site. Um, in this talk, I'm focusing quite a bit more on the methods than the results, because I feel like if you want to have the results, you could see the abstract of the paper, right? Um, <clears throat> but I thought for the people here that the methods might be a little more interesting. So we look in this paper at three different sites. The first two are Denisova and Chigirskaya Cave, which are uh, also present in Vivian's study. And as she mentioned, these are really nice because we have human DNA from bones, from skeletons or teeth at that, um, at those sites. And so we can take the DNA we get from the sediments and we can compare those to the skeletal elements and we can see if what we got sort of makes sense for, for what we expect to get there. And I'm not gonna show you any results from there. I can just tell you that in fact, it did all make sense. And I, I can talk about that in more detail if anyone is interested. But what I really wanna talk about is Galleria de las Estatuas in Northern Spain which is a cave where Neanderthals lived for between 40 and 50,000 years. Um, this has been excavated by Juan Luis Arzuaga and his team. And here I'm showing a stratigraphy of the site. So there's a flowstone cap. And then we have these different layers. So level one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and we know that Neanderthals lived there because we find all of these stone tools sort of throughout the entire stratigraphy. <clears throat> 
Um, and then we can get the dates using OSL dates, uh, single grain OSL from the different layers. And despite Neanderthals having lived there for tens of thousands of years and, and, and leaving all of their tools, there's only a single bone, a single Neanderthal bone that's been recovered at the site. It's a tiny pinky bone from a toe, right, from a, from a foot. Um, and it's so small that they basically told us to bug off when we asked them about getting DNA from it, right? They said, there's no way there's gonna let us, let us drill into the only bone that they ever found at this site, right? Um, <clears throat> but so in, in a sense, this is really exactly what we want, right? This is a place where like most Pleistocene uh, occupations, there's no human remains or very limited human remains. And yet we still wanna be able to learn about the people who lived here for tens of thousands of years. So, okay, so what we did is we took sediment samples going all the way down through the cave in multiple columns spaced uh, every few centimeters to try to get a really dense sampling of, of the site. Over half of these turned out to have human mitochondrial DNA, which is really super um, and is above average for sites that we get. Um, here on the left, I'm showing a mitochondrial phylogeny for Neanderthals, uh, similar to what Vivian showed earlier. It turns out that three of these sediment samples are really, really rich, and we're able to infer whole mitochondrial genomes for them and place them on the tree. So those three are shown here, one from layer two, one from layer three, and one from layer four. But that sort of leaves us similar to where we are with bones, right? Where we, we have, we know that people lived there, but we don't have any DNA representing sort of the majority of the time period. And so we used a new method for placing low coverage samples on the tree. And this is sort of motivated by the fact that mitochondrial genomes are um, sort of largely the same between two in individuals, but there are some informative positions. And so if you have a DNA sequence that lines up here, you aren't gonna be able to tell the difference between these. If you have one that's here, you get lucky and it can only really be the blue mitochondrial genome. If you have one that's here, it could be either the blue or the red one. And this is analogous to trying to identify transcripts from RNA-seq data where, for example, you have the different isoforms that could be generated of a particular gene, and then you have an RNA-seq read with a splice event here. It can really only be the red or the blue sequence here. And lots of times with single cell RNA-seq, you have very, very limited data per sample, similar to what you have for sediments. And so this is a really well-studied problem. And there's this method called Callisto that does this sort of probabilistic uh, transcript abundance estimation. It works really well actually with our sediment DNA and I would encourage people who are looking at um, say like chloroplast or mitochondrial DNA to, to maybe look into it for resolving some of their data. Um, okay, so then what we wanna do is use this method to assign the samples to populations. So essentially for each sediment sample say which uh, consensus sequence which is shown up here at the top, which of these mitochondrial genomes does this look the most like? And we can do this going all the way down through the stratigraphy. And what really stands out is that we have essentially two different patterns here, right? In the upper and younger layers, we mostly see the same groups of, of mitochondrial genomes represented. And in the lower layers, we see this very different mitochondrial genome over here um, with some mitochondrial diversity. And you can, with simulations, you can show that in fact, you know, this isn't just the movement of these, this mitochondrial DNA up here, sort of down through the sediments, um, you would get a different pattern if that was the case. So you really had this mitochondrial diversity at the bottom here. So, okay, so now we have kind of for the first time for any Pleistocene site, a complete time series of human, human genetics, right? Where we don't just have one bone or two bones even, we have a really full picture here. It looks like maybe there's a transition, but we don't know for sure. So we wanna look at nuclear DNA now. So the question for Estatuas is, is this mitochondrial DNA transition actually real? Was it a population replacement where one group of Neanderthals lived there and then they were replaced by another group? Um, or is it just a loss of mitochondrial diversity? More generally, we wanna be able to ask who lived there and how are they related to other Neanderthals? But as Vivian described, there are lots of challenges with human DNA and sediments, in particular that you have a lot of faunal DNA sort of represented by this purple blob here and very, very little human DNA represented by this orange dot. Um, and even within that orange dot, most of the human nuclear genome is not informative for population history. So you and I are identical for 99.99% of our genome, something like that, right? Um, so it's not gonna tell us about what populations we came from. 
In addition, the nuclear genome has a lot of homology to other mammals, right? Because we're related to other mammals. So there are many places in the genome where the cow genome is identical to mine, right? Um, okay, so we, we, we get around these users by targeting, uh, having a custom array targeting 1.7 million sites in the nuclear genome. Um, and it, these sites, they're informative for human history. So here, for example, we have an A at the position of interest in humans, an A in Denisovans, and a T in Neanderthals. So we might say, okay, if we see a T in our DNA at this position, this is evidence that we have actual Neanderthal DNA. Super, we have Neanderthals at this site. But if we look at other mammals in this region, you know, the, the same sort of the same part of the genome, we can see that T is actually the ancestral state here. Um, so it could be Neanderthal DNA, it could be cow DNA, right? So what we do is we target regions of high mammalian diversity, and that looks like this. So the non-mammalian species are, or sorry, the non-primate species are down here at the bottom, and you can see that between the human genome and any given non-primate mammal, there are quite a few substitutions, right? So we should not only be able to avoid capturing that DNA to begin with, but we should be able to tell the difference if we, if we do get it, right? We can really tell if we have Neanderthal DNA or, or pig DNA or something like that, right? Not all of the genome looks like this. So this is a low diversity region. And here, the horse genome shown here in this line is 100% identical to the human genome, right? You would not be able to tell the difference, even though there's, this is an informative position that's informative for human and Neanderthal history. Okay, so we've developed these, the, got these positions. We're gonna test this by looking at simulated faunal DNA. So in this case, simulated brown bear DNA, where we make it look like ancient DNA, like one of our libraries. We're gonna map this DNA to the human genome. And the reality is that a lot of it maps to the human genome because of this homology. So here are the unmapped reads, and then here are the mapped reads, you know, mapping to the human genome. And what we hope for is that the low diversity regions have bear DNA that will map to it, and the high diversity regions don't have bear DNA mapped to it. And in fact, that's what we see, right? So this is the relative proportion of bear DNA mapping to these regions in the human genome. And as we have more diversity, we get less bear DNA. So we targeted these positions in our array. And um, you know, if, if we had looked at these, we would still have substantial amounts of, of sort of other, um, other mammalian species. Okay. so. Now we do our capture, we do some additional computational processing. Yahtzee, hopefully we can actually get our, our human DNA out of the funnel DNA. But you know, there's still this question of like, what if we didn't? What if we screwed up? What if 50% what if of it is bear or hyena or mouse or whatever? What if all of it is? You know? And so we really wanna be able to tell that. And so we developed methods to get per sample estimates of the percentage of hominin DNA in each sample, right? And this is done by looking at these hominin diagnostic sites where you have a mutation that occurred somewhere in the ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. And so it's a derived state in all humans, all Neanderthals, all Denisovans, and ch chimps. And so if you see the ancestral allele, then this is evidence that you have something else, right? That you don't have humans or, or chimps. Um, and so with this, we can get a percentage estimate of the percentage, sorry, an estimate of the percentage of hominin DNA. And you can see that, so this is after capturing, but before metagenomic filtering. So all of this DNA maps to the human genome. It in fact even maps to the human genome in our really diverse regions, right? And yet for some sediment samples here, 50% of the, of the library of the DNA is actually non-human, right? Um, whereas for a lot of them, it, it is 90%, 99% human. And after we do some metagenomic filtering, we can increase that human percentage Although I'll note that some sediment samples still have substantial non-human faunal DNA mapping to the human genome at our regions of interest. And so we can identify this now and we can kick them out of our analysis. Um, after we do this, you know, then our DNA sort of looks like, like most other DNA, right? We still see this ancient DNA damage that Vivian talked about um, with the caveat that we get very little DNA per sediment sample. So maybe a few thousand, a few tens of thousands of reads per sample. Okay, so that's the methods. Now we're going to answer the question of which Neanderthals lived there. And we're going to try to place these sediment samples on the published skeletal data. So this is Vindia, Chigirska, and Altai are three high coverage Neanderthal genomes for which we have a really nice phylogeny that's been published in these other papers. And if we go through Astatuas and we go from the upper layers downwards, so right, going older, getting backwards in time, 
we look at the younger layer, layer two, we can see that the sediment samples there fit on the tree right here. So they branch off right around the time that Vindia and Chigirske have branched off from each other. And from the OSL date, we know that that layer was about 80,000 years old. Whoops. Um, and so we can infer a branch here, right? So we can actually add the Neanderthals who lived in this particular time period to this Neanderthal phylogeny. We can do that with a different portion of layer two, which is an older portion of layer two. So it has an older OSL date and it has the same branch time here. We can in fact then look at layer three in even older OSL date and it still has the same branch time. So for layer three, we really have Neanderthals who are practically the ancestors of all known late Neanderthals. Um, if we go then just a, a few thousand years older in terms of our OSL dates, we get to layer four um, and yet the branch time really dramatically splits and now we're up here with Altai, right? So this really indicates that this transition that we saw with the mitochondrial DNA is real and we see a gap in the, you know, a big jump where this population occupied the cave here and this population occupied the cave here. We could also take this a little bit further and put other skeletal data on here that has been previously published. So here are three samples that have low coverage genomes for them. And one thing that stands out is that they also branch around the same time periods, right? And so you have this sort of radiation around 135,000 years ago and a radiation around 105,000 years ago. Um, so, you know, we identify these possible radiations. It's not clear exactly what's happening. Maybe there was a refugia for Neanderthals here and then they spread out around Europe and then that process happened again. Um, but I think this is an interesting open question. So anyway, in conclusion, we can sort of do this stuff and I think methods and testing are important. And all of this is published in, in a paper very recently. Um, and we couldn't really do this work at all without our archeological collaborators. And so it's really great to have these colleagues um, in Siberia and in Spain, you know, and they guide our investigation of the sediments and put them in context and everything. So I really have to say, thank them. So anyway, I'm sorry, I went over time. I apologize. And here now it's time for whatever questions or something. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, you did uh, uh, took a bit more time, but I think it was uh, interesting enough. <laughs> I will not blame you. Uh, we have a first question from Oran uh, in the chat. You can start to raise your hand and I will keep track. Um, can I ask directly or is that acceptable? Sorry? Can, can I ask uh, directly? Okay. Yeah, you can, you can ask either Benjamin or Vivian. Okay. Uh, I have a, I have actually like two questions, but they're, they're tied, so they're not specifically to a person. Uh, thanks so much for, for these great, wonderful presentations. I'm a big fan. Uh, and I, I would like to ask, like, I, ever since these sediment papers came out, I've tried to wrap my, wrap my mind around, like, how these are actually, like, preserved in the sediment. Like, why, what process of, uh, like, decay in the, like, biological tissue of these living things have caused these uh, preser like have, have caused the DNA to stick into uh, the soil. Like, do you, like, do we have any speculations on like how like are they in are they in the for example the uh, feces of these animals? Are they are they in the uh, like the bodies that are not preserved preserved themselves? And the second question is actually like related to that. Like, my question is like when when in a like in an excavation layer when in a like in a soil when do you say to yourself okay I should stop and take a sample for this sort of sediment analysis. I mean, perhaps like, you know, perhaps like when you, when you, when you excavate, you see something that, okay, perhaps this soil is, has a, I don't know, perhaps like an organic material in it that I should take a sample. Like, when do you say this to yourself? That I think, thank you very much. If you hear me. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I should take that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that you're more suited to take that question. <laughs> okay. Um, so to the answer of the first question, where sort of where the sediment DNA comes from, essentially, and how it's preserved, I think the honest answer is we don't know yet. Um, so there's been a lot of work also before uh, and sort of unrelated to human DNA, um, a lot of work that has been looked at. And it's been hypothesized that it can be essentially any body fluid that you can think of. Certainly feces is a very good uh, hypothesis, I think. So the feces disintegrating and becoming 
the sediment uh, is certainly a, a, a good possibility. Um, DNA can bind to organic material, it can bind to inorganic material, we know that from bone, we know that from sediments, so there's quite a lot of options there uh, as to where the sediment comes from. Um, I think at least in the pilot study that we looked at, uh, that, I, that I talked about, um, specifically for the human DNA content, what we saw is that when you took sort of a sediment sample, which is, I don't know, a, a tube like this and sort of uh, whatever few milligrams that come into it, and you take different subsamples from it, um, when it's positive, so when you do have ancient hominin mitochondrial DNA there, it did tend to be sort of homogenous, so the same amount we get from different subsamples, um, which sort of maybe says something about, you know, homogenous uh, distribution. Uh, except for one, uh, we had one um, exception where um, from a specific sediment sample in Denisova cave, we had one subsample that had, I, don't, I think more than 50 times more DNA, more human DNA than the others. And what we think happened there is that there was just a microscopic piece of a bone or a tooth um, that was there. We also had evidence that this sort of comes from, or was compatible with coming from a single individual. And so that's also that's certainly a possibility, sort of micro fossils, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but sort of microscopic uh, parts of, of skeletal remains that sort of become um, the sediment. Um, so the second question is how do you how, how do you know where to sample if I understand it correctly? Um, so for this we rely a lot on our archaeologists uh, collaborators, right? They know their sites the best. Uh, what we often do when we screen a new site for DNA preservation, um, we try to sort of spread our sampling as much as possible throughout the stratigraphy. Um, and we do ask our collaborators if they can, based on their knowledge of the site, to point out places where they think that there was more human activity, um, just to increase our chances of, of, of finding uh, hominin DNA specifically. Um, but yeah, we, sort, we usually sort of screen new sites using between 5, 10, 15 samples, sort of spread out through the stratigraphy. And if we get good hits, then you would go back to the site and sort of do deeper sampling uh, when necessary. I would I would add to that a bit um, that you know one thing that we like is if, for example, you're excavating and you can be very very careful when that's happening and you find a tool or something, right? And you can somehow remove it and get the sediment exactly underneath it or something like that. I mean, maybe this is a stretch, but you could imagine. I think, I don't know if Vivian mentioned this, but like mostly what we do have is like a, a face, right? That you would sample in the previously excavated face, not so much as you're going and as you're, as you're going along through the excavation, but you can certainly imagine some scenarios where you can try to do that carefully and just to try to find sections of the DNA where there's not gonna be much human contamination. And also there's, there's a lot of work showing that the, I mean, the sediment maybe binds to clay and that sort of stuff. So you could, I don't know if you would target um, particular parts of the stratigraphy. Anyway, that's all. Thank okay. you. So we have a, a question from Nicolai after Anna, Pete, and Ralph in this order. So Nicolai, if you want to start. Hi, hi. Thanks a lot. Uh, amazing, amazing studies, amazing talks. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. So I, I have a question uh, mostly to Benjamin because he mentioned that, uh, um, yeah, first of all, I really appreciate your very, very a uh, careful way of disentangling um, um, hominin reads from, from faunal reads. That's very cool, very interesting. So you said after all this careful filtering, you got like a few thousand reads per sample. So I wonder, is it at all enough for variant calling and doing phylogeny analysis? Yeah, so it, it it's the answer is that it's not really enough. I mean, so, <laughs> but what you can do, so for the, so we had to develop new methods essentially for placing the sediment samples on the Neanderthal phylogeny. Um, and that sort of, I didn't, didn't really describe because it's really very specific to Neanderthals. Um, but you know, what you do is you sort of leverage the high coverage genomes and you say, okay, if you saw some DNA from in a particular position and, and, and the high coverage genomes had these genotypes, what's the probability of observing the genotype that you see or the base that you see in the Neanderthal DNA at any given point in the phylogeny. So it's sort of this full maximum likelihood estimate um, of the branching time and it incorporates 
funnel contamination and, and human modern human contamination. Um, and so, yeah, so, but doing something like it normally is done like the, these admix graphs or like QP graphs or, um, oh, somebody's echoing here, uh, or the, or the D stats or something like that is, is more challenging with the sediment DNA just because there's very little data. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, really. Thanks, it does, thanks. So we have a question from Anna. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the nice talk, it was really, really great. My question is more uh, regarding contamination because the human contamination, you cannot really avoid it. So my question is when you're doing this enrichment step, um, how can you avoid that you're enriching like modern human DNA? I mean, this is exactly the same as for bones as well, right? That, that you're going to have human contamination on bones. We do the same, similar captures for bones and yes, you're gonna have human contamination and you just have to computationally deal with it. You know, whether you can filter it out or whether you can only use deaminated reads or if you have a method that specifically, you know, uh, co-estimates, for example, the modern human contamination or something. Um, for Neanderthals, it's really nice because they're very different, you know, from modern humans in a lot of respects. Like you can tell, you can really tell between the human contaminant and the, and the Neanderthal. And if you have modern human DNA in your sample, you know that it's contaminant, right? If you have a hundred thousand year old sample from Spain or something. I think it's going to be trickier when we start looking at, you know, sites that are actually modern human occupations. Um, because then, yeah, you're starting with something where you have 10,000 reads and some of them are, con you know, might be contaminants, et cetera. So, um, I don't, yeah, it's tricky, I guess. Um, we have a question from Pete. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. And thanks, Benjamin and Vivian for excellent talks. Uh, Benjamin, I've got a quick question for you on uh, the bioinformatic filtering you did uh, for removing the faunal bycatch. I was just wondering, uh, were there any particular mammalian taxa that were particularly problematic and kind of remained after the bioinformatic filtering or was it pretty much random? Yeah, that's a good question. So most, uh, most of the sediment symbols after that filtering didn't, after the bioinformatic filtering, which was done with Kraken, which is sort of tries to take each read and assign it. Um, most of the sediment samples didn't have much um, faunal DNA remaining. And that, no, I didn't actually look and see what was left, what seemed to be left afterwards. That would be, that would be interesting to do. Um, it may be tricky because, you know, kind of by definition, the stuff that's remaining is stuff that maps to the human genome at our places of interest and isn't caught by Kraken. You know, I mean, it's not super clear to me how you would even determine what that is, <laughs> right? Um, but... Yeah. But yeah, that would be really interesting. I don't know. It, and it could be that it, uh, different parts of the genome attract different mammals, as it were. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. So we have a question from Alf. I'm going very quick because we have many questions. Okay. It's good if we can yeah. you get so, in some. Thanks. Uh, very interesting talks, both. I have a question to Benjamin and, and uh, I found it specifically impressing how you place these different uh, sequences on the, on a tree, you know, including uh, published ones and also also your own. Uh, that said, uh, what what I saw there is, I mean, it looked a bit like a, a dream tree. It did not look like a within species tree of a, a sexually re uh, reproducing uh, species. So my question here is, do you really think that? Um, that this is a reality, so there are different lineages, or, or is it a method issue not allowing for reticulation? Because within a certain time period, you made it. So because of the inheritance, you might expect reticulation. Thank you. You're on mute, Reza. Oops, sorry. sorry about that. One thing that I'll say is that the, the method is really anchored on this high coverage tree, which just has the three Neanderthals in it. And so if you, um, what you can do is you can say, okay, where on the tree does this sample lie? And there's nothing that keeps it from being, say, on its own, you know, on one of the single branches or at the, at the, at the intersection of those. Um, you know, so the, the method sort of allows 
in that way, you to place the sample anywhere, it's not constrained. But what it doesn't allow you to do is say, for example, this sediment sample and this sediment sample, actually they both branch off of the main tree at some place, but they are the same branch or they're different branches of their own, right? So you can't add like a new node essentially somewhere else on the tree. So what is entirely possible is that, for example, the sediment samples that we have are on the Mesmyska one lineage, which, which, so this is one of the low coverage Neanderthals that diverges from Chigurska and Vindhya at the same point as the sediment samples. What we wouldn't be able to tell is if those sediment samples are actually even further down on the Mesmyska lineage. So I do think that there's some methodological limitations that have to be kept in mind. But, but if, eventually, if you would have more full genomes, that could be healed, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Nora. So maybe you want to say it, or I can read it as you like. Hi, ah, yeah, you can read it. But have a better. I read it. Ah. Uh, okay, your question is, uh, is it possible to apply this study to modern humans? Uh, I work in Patagonia, and according to genetic evidence, there are human replacement. Unfortunately, there are very few human remains. Would it be possible to do it with this sample? Maybe, Vivian, you can answer. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, in, we, all, we all only have Homo sapiens, uh, but there are several archaeological gaps, and at least in one of the, in one of the areas where I work, there has been human replacement. Uh, so would it be possible to apply this to sediments to see if some of the gaps and changes in the archaeological re record are related to, um, I don't know, genetic replacement, genetic changes? I mean, different groups. They are different groups. Yeah. They are mitochondria on both sides, I mean. Yeah, so I think generally, yes, it can certainly be applied. Um, as Ben alluded to this, working with sort of ancient modern humans is in some way a bit trickier than working with archaic hominins because you cannot anymore rely on these um, sort of fixed or nearly fixed differences in the genome between these different groups. Um, and you have the additional problem of sort of modern contamination. Um, so one would have to sort of deal with this and that can be dealt with computationally. Um, what we often do, yeah, as Ben mentioned, is working with only reads that show these signs of deamination at the, their ends, for example. Um, so it would require, I think, yeah, a bit deeper, um, sort of working through the, the, the analysis a bit deeper, but it's certainly possible. Yeah, and I think it's also a very interesting question. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a question from Nihan. Uh, do you want to say it if you are around? Uh, otherwise, I can say it. So when sampling cave sediment, how important is that the layer are freshly exposed, excavated? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, I don't know how uh, if it's crucial, I think. When it's possible, the gut feeling is that it is better to acquire sort of fresh samples from a, a freshly excavated area, um, particularly when you're thinking of um, uh, sections that have been exposed to the elements for several decades sometimes. I think it's quite nice to be able to sort of freshen up the things um, before we sample, particularly when working on in areas with difficult context. It's nice to be able to take fresh sediments and sort of immediately put them in the freezer and sort of Kept, keep as much as possible in the best conditions, but it's certainly not crucial. Um, uh, we've had several examples by now of samples taken even decades ago and kept at room temperature and that DNA was still preserved in them. Um, so that's a bit the beauty of this is that you can also try and apply this uh, on archives of sediments that were collected for other purposes. We often go back to samples taken, for example, for pollen analysis, for OSL analysis, and it's definitely also possible. Okay, great. So uh, I think we, we have two more questions and we can stop with that after you had a lot of questions already. So we have a question from Mota Afe uh, that is about leaching. And this is a classical question for all of us. Uh, so how can you trust the data in terms of age and how can you trust the retrieve data is not due to leaching from upper layers. And I have no clue for cave sediment actually. 
what so, do you think? I mean, I, I guess there's probably many answers to this question. And I think that maybe I'll give a short answer and uh, Vivian wants to, to give some more. So, I mean, I think you really, it needs to be context dependent, right? So you need to examine this question at every site, at every layer that you look at. We rely on this recent paper a lot on our archeological colleagues, right? So that they, um, you know, so the, the OSL dates, for example, that they did, they're single grain OSL and you don't see a lot of skew in the dates for the OSL, right? Which if you had dramatically different ages of the sediment samples within a single OSL tube, then you would see, for example, a mixture of dates between one grain and another grain. Um, so this is evidence that they're actually very homogenous and it's, they all at least came from the same date-ish, right? Um, they can look at pollen and say, okay, between between these two layers, there's really different types of pollen that we see here. And we don't see, you know, whatever was above, we don't see it below. And that's evidence that there wasn't substantial movement down. Um, also Vivian and some of her work has shown that the DNA binds quite tightly to the sediments, right? That you put DNA in sediments and then wash water through it and not much comes out, right? So this would also indicate that the, if the sediment's not moving, probably the DNA is not moving. Um, but no, I mean, I think that this is a really, something you really need to be concerned about with every site that you look at. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then we have the last question from Christina. So uh, that is... might have, did you have something else to say to that? Sorry. No? No, she doesn't. <laughs> um, so the last question is actually related to the one from Nihan about freshly exposed excavated sediment. So, uh, what experience there is in analyzing DNA from sediment that has been excavated in a cave from a long time ago and storing room temperature? Would you use that? Is it full of fungi? Um, no, I have never actually saw anything becoming uh, full of fungi. That's a, that would be kind of nasty. As I said, we have experience with, with such cases and it did work. Um, this is often sometimes it's often the case when you sort of want to try the site for the first time and see if there's a good reason to go back to the site. So rather than you know starting a whole excavation campaign, rather see what's uh, what you get from what's out there. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's it's possible it can't work. Great. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was uh, very impressive work, and I'm sure you will continue to do this kind of thing for the future. Um, I will take a few minutes before we leave. It was a long day for many of us and the start of the day for others uh, to say stuff about the society. So of course, if you are not part of the society, you, you can uh, leave this room if you wish, but you can also uh, stay. So I would just like to say that we will have one uh, other seminar before summer, so in June. Um, and after during summer, we will stop it for two months. I think we all need a rest, <laughs> definitely. And I think we will continue from September and we have already talk, uh, planned for June that we will advertise later. Uh, the second thing I wanted to discuss and while I, I'm talking, you can write stuff in the chat if you want to discuss something, um, is one of the projects we have started with the society is to create a, a working group that is named African Said ADNA Working Group. And the point uh, of this project is uh, when we created this society, we realized that we, have, um, we had no researcher from Africa working with said ADNA, and uh, it was a pity. So we would like to, uh, yeah, to support African research doing said ADNA and to put the African researcher uh, with a central role in this research. So with Cecilia Barouillet, that is uh, another member of the society and uh, of the board, we worked a lot actually uh, and countless hours for the last, uh, uh, for the last month, I'm creating a, a symposium with uh, researchers from the society and African researchers that would be interested to uh, actually do uh, research uh, with said ADNA. So we will advertise that soon. Uh, some of you already know about that because you are uh, involved in the program. So we will have a, a half day or two hours of talking about uh, research uh, in Africa uh, and how we can initiate a bipartite uh, proposal to do new research there. Uh, so this is one of the projects that took most of our time. And, and of course, uh, I would be super happy to initiate other projects in the society, but everything takes a lot of time. <laughs> so it's impossible to do too much uh, in the same time. I think when we will uh, create this working group for, for real, it would be very nice if we can uh, help 
other from the society to create this kind of working group. For instance, here we are targeting uh, Africa, uh, African research, but in South America also, it would be great uh, to have a leader uh, that take uh, action to do research there. Uh, it cannot come from me because uh, I have too much on my plate already, but uh, feel free to propose ideas. And if you want to lead a working group or something, we can help you to uh, yeah, communicate about that and create a network. That would be great. It could be also a human cell DNA working group. I mean, it's already uh, the point of the lab in Germany, but there are probably other researchers that can do uh, this kind of research uh, around. So yes, if you have something to add, feel free. I talk too much already. So I think everyone is happy uh, about your talk today. When uh, is the next uh, nature paper coming? Benjamin and Vivian. I think Vivian has to answer that one. <laughs> I mean, there, yeah, I guess there are some stuff cooking from the lab in Germany. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely follow up projects. I'm really excited about some of them, but we can't, you know. <laughs> But thank you everyone so much for, for, for coming. It's really great to see so many people here and um, the questions were really wonderful too. So it was nice to be able to, to do this. And thanks Eric for inviting us. Welcome. Uh, you can continue discussing that uh, in the Slack if you want. Vivian, sorry. Yeah, just wanted also to say thanks. It was really, really nice. And, and yeah, it's great to be with people who are interested in dirt. It's nice. Good. Uh, These are the children, thanks. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. I think we can close this meeting and uh, see you in one month or have a good summer if I don't see you. Uh, and we will continue in September to do nice stuff, I, I hope, together. Bye. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>